so I want to have a serious talk with you. And I know you hate it when old folks say we want to have a serious talk, but I want to have a serious talk with you. And I want to talk to you about unlimited, the concept of unlimited, because, because we're unlimited, right? We're unlimited in our hopes, we're unlimited in our dreams, we're unlimited in our ideas, but we're also unlimited in our egos, in our greed, in our wastefulness. And we are limited. We are limited in our bodies and in our time. We have limits. There are limits to resources. Think about it. If you think about your experience since you were young, and if you think about what's going on next, what's going to happen as you age. You know, there's a famous quote from Einstein who said, there are two things that are infinite. <laughs> The universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about the universe. <laughs> Let's talk about the universe. This puts us thinking in a very interesting perspective. What do we know about the universe? We've actually mapped the universe. Astronomers and cosmologists have mapped the universe. We look with the best telescopes off into the distance into, the, into space time, back in time, and we see a 13.7 a billion year old universe, and we see this universe that is finite, but unbounded, or it is infinite, but bounded. So this is an important thing to think about. That's what cosmologists tell us. And if we zoom in from the edges of the universe to the Milky Way galaxy, where we, we, inhabit this position in the Milky Way galaxy. And from the Earth, looking out, we see the Milky Way and its beauty, and we see beyond the Milky Way stars. We see stars like Antares. We see stars like Arcturus. We see Arcturus, and we see our sun. We see and realize our sun and our Earth. We realize that our, that our Earth formed in this dust cloud around our central star, and this dust cloud, which ultimately gave rise to all of the planets, this cloud of dust that accreted the planets that formed some billions of years ago to give, us, to give rise after colliding with all these particles to generate this beautiful Earth that we inhabit, we see this Earth, which is revolving around a rather mediocre star, but it's home. It's our only home. It is the only hope we have. And we try to understand, in the context of time, an Earth that's 4.52 billion years old. And I realized, that how do we understand this? The concept of 4.2 billion years. How can we grasp the enormity of that time? And I say we might be able to understand it if we map the history of the Earth onto a football field, because we all know about football fields, right? So let's map 4.52 billion years onto a football field and look at things in that perspective. The early part of the Earth was dominated by this growing period where collisions with large asteroids and all this dust in the air that was part of the solar disk formed the planets, no less the Earth. The first life forms occurred already 3.5, maybe as much as 3.8 billion years ago, which is around the 20 yard line on our football field. The two life forms that you probably know about were prokaryotic, that occurred first, as far as we can tell, and then later on, cells called eukaryotic cells, which are a little more complicated and slightly larger, and they occur somewhere around the 30 yard line. And now these organisms contaminated the atmosphere. The early Earth's atmosphere didn't have very much oxygen, but those organisms liberated oxygen from water and contaminated the atmosphere. That about 45 to 50 yard line, the atmospheric composition changed with oxygen. This was incredibly important because after that, we started to see multicellular organisms arise. But they don't get here until we're all the way down close to the 15 yard line, the 20 yard line, somewhere in that region about a billion years ago. And then at the 12-yard line, we have what's called the Cambrian Explosion, the great diversification of life that occurred on the 12-yard line. And then insects show up at the 9-yard line, amphibians on the 8-yard line, and the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs arrive at the 6-yard line, 
Think of it. The earth was dominated by these enormous reptiles. And they were, they were here until about the 1.4 yard line when a horribly unexpected event occurs. An asteroid collides with a planet and really ruins their day. <laughs> but they're here for a long time, nearly 200 million years. The dinosaurs reigned supreme. When, when they disappeared, the mammals, which actually got here, according to the fossil record, around the four yard line, they really take over after the one yard line when the dinosaurs are wiped out. So these mammals start to diversify and they're really very well adapted. And, and now finally something that vaguely resembles us arrives on the two yard line, two inches rather, two inches, not two yard line, two inches from the goal. The first things that look like us. And we, we arrive one fifth of an inch from the goal. We arrive one fifth of an inch from the goal. Now, in order for us to understand how we have dominated the planet, <clears throat> we need to put this into context. So the last glaciation ended about 12,000 years ago. And so we need to be able to look at this. So let's zoom in on the hair on the back of your hand to understand the time interval that we're talking about. And the last glaciation ended about three hair widths into, before we get to the goal, right? Um, agriculture happens at about one and a half hairs. And then we have the Egyptian and the Chinese empire. That's about one hair diameter. And then we get to the Romans. They're about half of a hair diameter. And we have the Vikings. They're at about 20% of the hair's diameter. And then we zoom in on the hair and we see in the yellow circles some yeast cells and the white circles bacterial cells. And those yeast circle, those yeast sized cells on this hair, that represents the history of the United States. And those white circled bacterial cells, that's us. So here we are, these dominant organisms <clears throat> on the planet, actually the dominant organisms on the planet, so the ones we talked about, the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. In fact, if you want to know the truth, there are 10 times more bacterial cells on our bodies than there are human cells, and their genome's about 100 times larger than the human genome, and we represent an ecology, a walking ecology of microbes, but that's another lecture. I want to talk to you about us, because we, we represent an amazingly interesting experiment. If you look at the human population, plotted here in billions, you notice that we get to a very large population in a very sh short interval of time. In fact, it took us a really long time to put a billion people on the planet, and it took us a very short time to put six billion more. I mean, this is interesting to realize because we got to a billion in 1830, and there are you guys came on the scene around right, 1999 or 97 or so, and here we are. And this world population experiment has never been done before. And it's been fueled by oil. I mean, we realized already in the middle of the 19th century that oil had this amazing capacity. And we've diversified with our ingenuity, our unlimited ingenuity, the kinds of oil that's available and where we can get it. And we keep expanding our capabilities and expanding and expanding our capabilities until we're offshore and we're drilling oil everywhere. And we're driving this amazing population, which you see our cities are lit and we travel all over the globe and we control or manage 75% of all the land mass outside of, the, outside of the poles. We are flying all over the planet and it is all being run by oil. It is being run by fossil energy. And in fact, if we look at the distribution of people in the world right now, as indicated by these red dots, you realize that China and India, which together represent about 36% of the world's population, are really heavily populated. Whereas the United States, relatively minor population, somewhere around, well, 4.4% of the world's population, about 315 million people. There's 1.2 billion people in India and 1.3 billion people in China and the population is still growing. But if you look at the distribution of energy use in the world as indicated by this night sky composite from NASA, you realize 
that the United States, at less than 5% of the world's population, is using over 25% of the world's resources. Hmm. Now, we're exporting this lifestyle. And if India lived like we live in the United States, India alone would use 85% of the world's resources. They're currently using around 4% of the resources. And if India and China lived like we do in the United States, then India and China would require about two planet Earths to support our lifestyle in the United States. Now, this isn't fundamentally bad. What I'm talking about is the fact that the world is watching us. The world is watching you. Because really what we're talking about is your impact on the planet. You, meaning you, meaning the unlimited you, the unlimited creative you, you have the responsibility to the planet. Because if you think about that long timeline, you're it, you're the transition. Arguably, one of the most important times in human history, similar perhaps to the time when we transitioned from hunting and gathering food to having agriculture. And now we have to stop hunting and gathering our energy and figure out some sustainable basis for it. And we have to work on this. This will be our contribution to this incredible planet that we're inhabiting. And let me tell you just very briefly about a project that I've been doing for the last five years to try to find a replacement for fossil fuel that's sustainable. And it uses microalgae. And the reason it uses microalgae, because if you look at the amount of diesel produced by other crops, microalgae is by far, it's 100 times better than soy. So the question then is, can we grow microalgae without competing with agriculture, because we need to be able to grow food for this growing population, can we do this without competing? And the answer is, well, yes, maybe we can use wastewater. Maybe we can use the water that runs out from our coastal cities off into the ocean. Let's harness that water, and it has fertilizer in it that algae can grow in. Let's take advantage of these huge amounts of wastewater produced by our cities. And the way we propose to do this is a project we call OMEGA, which stands for Offshore Membrane Enclosures for Growing Algae. Let's build the system offshore. So the system will be an extension out into our coastal areas with these floating green bioreactors. And let's build it so we have solar energy and wave energy and wind energy. And so this takes big advantage of the fact that we're using very, very effectively using our coastal areas and we'll use the same structure to support aquaculture. So now we envision a system, an integrated system, in which our ingenuity combined with the use of a new space that's, no, that's sort of underutilized to develop a, a source of food, water, and fuel. We've started this project, we've built a system, we've tested it in its basis, and it seems to be functional. Now the problem is how do we expand this into something which will go viral in the world and people all over the world will emulate us in the United States and say, look, they're in the United States building systems that are sustainable, that are not competing with agriculture, and that will allow our future to continue in ways that we'll be happy for. The system we're talking about is a system that does biofuels. It doesn't compete with food. In fact, it expands our food and water capabilities and it's probably our only option because we can't build structures like that on land to grow algae because we just no space. And finally, it has amazing future opportunities because as sea level rises, we'll be able to do the floating bioreactors that I just described for you. So this is the thing we have to think about. The human population in your lifetime is probably going to get to nine or possibly even 10 billion people. This is you. This is you at 65, potentially, right? And we've pushed from, you've pushed from 2013 to about 2060, we'll be at nine or 10 billion people. And we need to be a lot smarter about how we're dealing with this. So let's think about the universe. Let's think about the universe model again, what I started with, in which I said that the universe may be finite, but unbounded. And we know that we are finite. We know that we are finite. We are finite in our, in our bodies. We're finite in our time. And yet, our imaginations and our ingenuity is unbounded. But we are also infinite. We're infinite in our needs. Our needs as a species. We're infinite in our needs because we constantly need resources. 
and yet our resources are bounded. And we must, we must respect the boundary conditions. In fact, it's so important that we know our limits. While we're unlimited, we must know our limits to be safe, to be responsible, and to understand the consequences of our existence. And not just for us, but for all those species that we share this planet with. And so let's prove that Einstein was wrong, that we are not stupid. Thank you.